Good morning. I want to welcome you to Williams Creek Baptist Church. We've gathered here this morning to worship and lift up the name of the Lord and to come under the counsel of His Word as we continue in the book of Revelation. This morning we take up the letter that Jesus dictates to His church in Thyatira. As we have seen in His previous letters, Christ's churches are positioned directly in the midst of enemy territory, the realm of Satan. Uh, the members of these churches lived in the, mo- in the midst of polytheistic, uh, cultic religions, idolatry. In, this, in these cities, uh, idolatry was not only politically and culturally saturated, but it was the norm and expectation of all of its citizens. Therefore, as we have seen, those who belong to Christ face great opposition, suffering, persecution, and all of this due to their fidelity to Christ. Their adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And we see this. We see this uh, continual presence of the reality of this occupied territory, satanic as it was. For example, Uh, The church in Smyrna dwelled in the midst of the synagogue of Satan, those who proclaimed to be Jews but were not. The church of Pergamon dwelled in the midst of the throne of Satan, and their brother Antipas was martyred in Pergamum where Satan dwells. But here, in our text this morning, we find that Satan is dwelling right in the midst of the church of Thyatira itself. John MacArthur, he notes that in this church at Thyatira, the evils of idolatry and sexual immorality were not only accepted and tolerated, they were even advocated. This church had gone so far as to not just allow sin, but even to encourage it. The seriousness of the situation is seen in the fact that many in the church had engaged the deep things of Satan. This church is typical of churches that tolerate sin. With the church in Thyatira, uh, there was much that was commendable, but there was this fatal flaw. And this letter is driven primarily to address this fatal flaw, not just for them, but for all churches throughout time. This letter shows what compromise with the world leads to. It leads to full-scale idolatry and immorality. This is not just a church infiltrated by the world such as Pergamos was. This is a church that has absorbed sin and error and lived and become comfortable with it. This kind of church is common today as it has been throughout the centuries, but completely, completely disobedient to the demands of the Lord of the church Himself. He commands that His church be pure and holy. He has set us apart. This church is in direct, overt violation of that command as would be any church that tolerates sin. The church of Ephesus was characterized by loyalty to Christ and sound teaching, but was lacking in love. In the church of Pergamos, or in the church of Smyrna, loyalty was tested by fire and proven true. They were faithful. In the church of Pergamos, the loyalty was lacking in moral passion, yet all three of these churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, were true to the faith and yet and, and had yet, not yet yielded themselves to the assaults of sin. Not so for the church of Thyatira. The situation there is far worse. Here, not merely a small minority had become indifferent to the will of the Lord, but large numbers were actually giving in to the demoralizing influences of the false teaching and immorality of a woman that Jesus describes as Jezebel. So let us read and hear and heed. 
Let us hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches in this letter to the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to begin there in verse 18. And to the church of, or to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than it at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the midst or searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as also as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for the gift of this day. What a blessing it is to gather in this place to come under Your Word. And Lord, we know that as our brothers and sisters in the churches uh, of Asia Minor were in the midst of hostile territory, in the, in the midst of the realm of the evil one, Satan. And we see the evidence of that with, with false religions and cults and, and worship of other things other than the one true God, You, Lord Jesus Christ. God, we live in such an era. All the eras of your churches face the realities of uh, this uh, false these false religions these false gods idolatry sexual immorality and all kinds of sin lord we face sin on any given day we are all sinners and we have all fallen short of your glory but it's by your grace lord jesus that even though we deserve death for our sin for that is the wages of death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Lord, in these words, You call us to hold fast in the midst of, of, these, of such evil days and at such evil times and that we would stand against the infiltration of the world and of sin. And the Lord, that we would repent of our sin each and every day. And we, Lord, we know that we can confess our sin and You're faithful and just to, to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God, guide us in the wisdom of these words. And let us hold fast until You come and we give You praise in the name of Jesus Christ, I do pray. And amen. Well, this morning we have this letter to Christ church in Thyatira. And here the Lord commends the church there in Thyatira. There are some things that, that he encourages them with. But then he condemns, most specifically, one key reality. Um, the reality of tolerating the sin of Jezebel, the teaching of this prophetess, this false prophetess. But there are some in the church of Thyatira. There was a majority that had uh, been taken and swayed by her ways, by her teachings, and had engaged and were engaging uh, in continuous sin. And, and Christ called them to repent, called her to repent, and called those that were a part of the church to repent of these sins. But there was 
a group among those, those people in, in that church that were holding fast. And Jesus encouraged them. He exhorted them to continue to hold fast until He comes. So we have this letter to Christ church in Thyatira. This commendation to Christ church in Thyatira. The condemnation to Christ church here in Thyatira. And finally, the exhortation to Christ church in Thyatira. As we have been begun with the previous letters, we, we look at this letter and it's, it is directed to the angel, to the pastor, to the, the leader of the church in Thyatira. Thyatira, as P.J. Wenzel writes, Thyatira was a city in a valley, a central hub of communication in its day. It sat on the bank of the Lycus River, which was a, a main tributary of the Hermes, Hermes Valley in which the city was situated. Tyre Tyre was built between 300 and 282 B.C. by Seleucus I, who was the founder of the Seleucid dynasty. Initially, it was built as a defense against a colony of Macedonian soldiers. It was to prevent them from coming into the most prized city of, the, of Asia Minor, Pergamos. Williams Ram, William Ramsey continues that not only did all communication and trade between those two great and rich valleys, the Hermes and Caicos, pass up down the veil, but also in certain periods and in certain conditions uh, of the general economy of Asia Minor and the Aegean lands. This was a main artery of the system of communication and travel. The land road connecting Constantinople with Smyrna and the south western region of Asia Minor goes that way and has been at some periods uh, the, one of the most important routes. The Imperial Post Road took that course in the Roman Empire during that times. Above all, when Pergamum was the capital of Asia under the kings, that was the most important road in the whole country. John MacArthur, he he writes that Tyre Tyre turned from a military place to, to become a commercial city. In fact, it became the city of wool and dyeing of cloth. Historians tell us it became the center of guilds, trade guilds, which would be much like our unions today. There were people who had the same trade who banded together. See that in Ephesus as, as Paul dealt with those realities uh, in the, when he went to, to, to share the gospel there. And it had more trade guilds in this city than of all the other cities of these seven letters. One of the curiosities of this town was the guilds where the people banded together for various trades they were engaged in. But more interesting than that was that each guild had their own god. Each guild had come to define a guardian god that particularly gave himself to taking care of them. And they worshipped that god. If you were associated with the guild, you were a religious group, and there was a God over that group that you had to worship. Associated with that worship was immorality, as, it is in, as in almost all pagan systems. And so there would be idols, idol feasts and celebrations, sexual rituals, and that could be very, very difficult for believers. Religiously, this little town wasn't really the, the center of anything. Uh, the chief god there was Apollo. And they had many false gods that they worshipped. One of the very prominent things there was the dying of cloth. And there's a very interesting note to make at this point. that We know in Acts chapter 16 about a certain lady by the name of Lydia. And it tells us there in Acts 16, 14, that a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, Tyre, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Paul was speaking of the gospel. At that time, she was in Philippi, probably on business, but her home was in Thyatira. Tyre. She was a seller of purple cloth. She was in the textile industry there. And Acts tells us that she heard the Apostle Paul and the gospel that he pre presented and she was converted along with some of her household. It could very well be the means by which the church was formalized there 
in Thyatira. We're, we don't know for sure. But we know that she was from Thyatira and a believer. She responded to the Gospel. This letter is from Jesus. And Jesus, as we've noted in each of these letters, He takes um, a description from chapter 1 and He reveals Himself in terms of that description which is most specific to that individual church. Christ asserts here, he, this, this letter from Him, uh, he, he asserts that He is the Son of God. Christ is asserting here His deity as God the Son. He uses uh, once again a specific description that we find from Revelation chapter 1 uh, where we note there in verse the, the second half of verse 14, and His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in the furnace. And He uses once again a specific description uh, that the divine messenger, that he is the divine messenger and, and judge, and and we see that you know even all the way back to Daniel, when Daniel he he reveals uh, this this uh, man that he saw this um, in, in a vision in in D Daniel chapter ten. He says in verse five, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of uh, Euphrates. His body was also was like barrel. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of His words were like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, this is Daniel's response when he saw this vision. Now I, Daniel, alone saw this vision while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell on them. And they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me. For my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. In other words, uh, Daniel is describing in, in his day being in the midst of the Holy Lord. Now, some would uh, describe this as um, a manifestation of, of, of the Lord God Jehovah. Many look at this as a pre-incarnate revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the same exact description that we find here. John, John reveals this in Revelation chapter 1, as well as, as we see it here in terms of this description, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, and His eyes are like flames of fire, and His feet like burnished bronze. And that's what he says here. And in, in so doing, uh, He is asserting His authority. Christ is not asserting, He's not only asserting that He is the, God the Son and, 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 and revealing His deity as uh, part of the Godhead. One in, in the Godhead of Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But Christ is asserting His authority as a righteous judge. His eyes like a flame of fire. And we see there, uh, when Christ comes again, He is coming to judge and wage war. As we see in, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, I saw heaven open, John says, and behold, a white horse, and he who, was, who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness He judges and wages war. And His eyes are a flame, a fire. Thomas Schreiner notes here that the Son of God deserves the same honor and glory as the Ancient of Days. That is the Lord Jehovah. He is to be venerated and worshipped in the same way God is. Like God, His eyes flame with fire, searching all things so that nothing is hidden from His gaze. Those who secretly practice evil cannot avoid His penetrating gaze and they will face judgment. And that is, that is a warning from Scripture. That is a warning uh, from the Lord Himself, He sees all things. He knows all things. He knows uh, the deepest recesses of our hearts and the depths of our soul. He knows, as, as, as David represents, He knows our thoughts from afar. He knows, a, a no, he knows the Word that is on our tongue before we speak it. 
There is no place that we can go from the presence of God, from the presence of Christ. And as, as we see in Acts chapter 17, Paul uh, in verses 30 and 31 describe Jesus as you know, He is the one, God has, has appointed Him is, is the one who's going to come and judge all of man. And He's given evidence that this is true by raising Jesus up from the dead. It says here that not only is, are His eyes like a flame of fire, but, but He has feet like burnished bronze. His feet like bronze. As we see in Revelation 19 and verse 15, it says when He comes with His feet, He will tread the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of God. He is coming to judge. And He's coming to destroy and to make war against His enemy. And His enemy certainly is Satan and all of His followers and all those who are under uh, the sway and the, the authority and the power of the evil one. And we see evidence that, of that here in our text with a, a, a false prophet, prophetess by the name of, of Jezebel. And, and she, is, she is misleading bondservants, those who belong to Christ, misleading them uh, with, with the depths, the deep things of Satan. He is coming to take his stand against those who are uh, against Him, are His enemies, who reject Him as the Son of God and as, as the Christ. He is coming to judge the world regarding sin. He came in the first place. He came in the first time in history uh, to seek and to save the lost. And we live in that era right now. We live in the era where the Gospel goes forth to the nations so that people might be saved from their sin. Saved from um, the idolatry and the false teachings and, and the sway of the evil one, Satan. That though we may be dead in our trespasses and sin, that Christ makes us alive together with Himself. And that we can belong to Christ and His kingdom. And we see at the very end that, that not only does um, this Christ promise those who hold fast, hold Him, uh, hold fast to the end until He comes, that the promise to them is that Christ is not only going to give them His kingdom, but He's going to give them a king Himself. Listen to what the Lord declares of His Son, the Son of God, in Psalm chapter 2. In verse 7, he says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of, their, of, your, uh, of the earth as uh, your possession. And here we see the judgment of the son of the Holy One, the, the son of Jehovah, the Lord Yahweh. This is Jesus. You shall break them with a rod of iron. Who's, who's them? His enemies. Those who reject Him. Those who worship other gods and refuse the one true God. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Here is an invitation to all those who would take their stand against the one true God and His servants. His Son, His Messiah, the King that He strengthens and raises up. He says to them, Show discernment, O kings. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son. In other words, surrender to the Son and worship the Son and pay tribute to the Son. And lift up and exalt the name of the Son. That He not become angry. And you perish in the way. For His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take their refuge in Him. And that it simply means that those who belong to Him. Who, who have found their faith in Him. Whom He has saved and brought them into the kingdom. 
This is the letter to the church that is in Thyatira. And he commends them. He offers the following commendation, the following commendation to his church there. He says, I know your deeds. He just breaks down a list of, of these deeds, these, these works. And these, again, these are works of, of ministry and service. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that the Lord prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he knows their deeds. He knows our deeds. He knows our deeds, whether they are honorable and godly and honoring to him and are part of, of the works that he has called us to do. And he knows our, our deeds which are evil. But Jesus knows their deeds. He, he's, he is uh, commending them. He is honoring them with regards to their deeds. There, there are many deeds that He speaks of here. And these deeds are, are um, commendable because of their love. And the word there is, is agape, which is often des described as divine love, the, the love of God, that they, they have much love, un unlike that we see in terms of, of the Ephesian church that they, they had lost their first love. They had left their first love. They are commended for their love. They are commended for their faith. And again, this pistis is, is the word, and, and the Greek word is, is for saving faith. They are commended for their faith. They are commended for their service. Diakonia is the word for ministry and, and service. And it's, it's where uh, everyone is, has been given a diaconia, a, a ministry of service, gifts of service. Uh, we are to be growing up in, in terms of the knowledge and the stature and the maturity of Christ so that we might do the work of service, His service, His ministry. And they are, are commended for their perseverance. Uh, hupomone means, and again, we've already looked at this this uh, word before, uh, even in this series, uh, it means and it is to endure under great trial and tribulation. In all these churches, we've, we've noted all these churches, uh, are, uh, they're facing the great realities of, of persecution because they live in cultures and cities that are saturated with idolatry and everything political to economics to the way of life and heritage and family and all this is, is just summed up in the realities of, of worshiping those false gods. And so to come to Christ, to denounce those other gods, and to live for the one true God brought great trial and tribulation. He goes on to say that with regards to these deeds, that their deeds were greater now than at first. In other words, uh, he saw that their deeds were growing, becoming more prominent. And that these deeds, they sprang from faith and love and service, a service to Christ. And all these, these are worthy virtues that we find in the Scriptures. And, and that's what characterizes the body of Christ. Love. Faith, perseverance, service. There were great and commendable things among the body of Christ in Tyre, Tyre, but yet Christ gets to the heart of this letter, this condemnation, most specifically uh, of one thing that is, is derailing, is, is bringing um, much... Um, not only um, trial to, to the church, it is, it is an infiltration of the, in, in terms of the church. It's not something on the outside of the church that's affecting them like persecution and, and, and trial and, and, and those kinds of things. It actually uh, has infiltrated. And it has affected. There are many in this church that have been misled by a false prophetess. And it says here that they have tolerated her presence. I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. And James Hamilton describes here uh, who this uh, Jezebel is. Uh, we are told that this Jezebel calls herself a prophetess. Jesus addresses the problem of impostor, uh, impostors at several points uh, in these letters. In Ephesus, they were dealing with those who called themselves apostles and are not. In Smyrna, 
They are dealing with those who say that they are Jews and they are not, but they are a synagogue of Satan. And here in Thyatira, they have this woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Fake prophets, false prophets cannot fool the one whose eyes are as a flame of fire. We can trust Jesus. And we can trust His Word to tell us the truth. We should measure those who make claims for themselves against the Word of God. We need to test the spirits, brothers and sisters. As John says in his epistle, we must test the spirits and see if they are from God or not. Many false prophets in our day, we need to see it exponentially uh, unfolding in terms of of what we have in, in, in terms of worldwide communications that we, we have in, in webs, uh, in terms of the websites and social media and all these kinds of things. I mean, these kinds of false prophets, false prophecies, false teaching, false gospels, uh, they permeate uh, you know, digital media throughout the world and it can have great and overwhelming influence, not only in, in people's lives, but within the church. People are easily swayed by these types of false gospels and false teachers. And oftentimes, there, there seems to be a lot of legitimacy to what they're saying. And they're engaging Scriptures and these kinds of things. But as Hamilton notes, and as the Scripture reveals, that we can know them by their fruits, and we, we go to the Word of God, we study the Word of God, and we're able to see what is from God and what is not from God. What well, we find here in Thyatira that this woman that Jesus describes as a Jezebel that this church has tolerated. In other words, uh, they have engaged in her false prophecies. And that these teachings that she is, she is teaching and leading, uh, Jesus says, my bond servants astray. Now, Jezebel identifies the kind of woman that she is. It's, it's, it's not her not, name, most likely. It is describing for us, it's, it's giving us insights in, in terms of, of what kind of woman this is. She, Jesus is using the name Jezebel um, that, that in this one word, if, if we have an understanding of the Old Testament Scriptures, that these people, that we as His church, we would know what kind of woman this is. Again, James Hamilton clarifies that in the Old Testament, Jezebel was a foreigner who taught her idolatry to the Israelite king who married her. She was thus one who did not belong to the people of God, who infiltrated the people of God, and who led the people of God into idolatry. And we might add that Jezebel married Ahab, who was king of the northern kingdom of Israel, and as a result of that marriage and her false prophecies, she led Ahab uh, to, to break away uh, in, in terms of uh, the northern kingdom, to break away from Israel. So identifying this woman as a prophetess, he's, he is saying, Jesus is saying, he's identifying her as a false prophetess. That, that the false prophets are those who mislead, who, who teach things and lead others astray. And that's, that's what Jesus is saying. He's not just saying that, he's, that she's leading uh, people astray in terms of, of the culture and the city and the life, and the, those that are engaged in idolatry and steeped in all that. No, he says that she teaches and leads my bondservants away into idolatry and immorality. And they were committing acts of immorality. And again, Im immorality is certainly, you know, in essence, um, you know, the immorality ha has to do with that which is not moral. And it's often connected with uh, sexual. It's, it's, it's a sexual nature, a sinning in, in terms of sexual um, corruption and those kinds of things, sexual rituals and cultic rituals and all these kinds of things that were summed up um, and then not only summed up in the idolatry of those days, but I idolatry of our days. These bond servants, true believers, are found 
in the church and they are committing acts of immorality. Paul, he wrote this letter to the Ephesian church in, in, in chapter 5 and, and he um, challenges, charges uh, those who belong to Christ and His church in, in Ephesians 5 verse 2. Uh, he, he calls us to walk in love and that love is defined by God. We need to walk in the love of God just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not be named among you as is proper among the saints. Jesus is declaring that immorality is named among the church at Thyatira in complete opposition to His call and His command that no such thing uh, be in that way. These bond servants, uh, these true believers, not only committed acts of immorality, but these bond servants ate things sacrificed to idols. And it's interesting uh, to think about, you know, you know, uh, not long after the gospel uh, left Jerusalem, went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world, uh, w- that we begin to see. Uh, not only Jews coming to Christ as, as we see prominently at the very uh, outset of the beginning of the church, that we would begin to see Gentiles. People from other nations coming to faith in Christ. And as a result of this, in Acts chapter 15, uh, the apostles, uh, they convened a, a council to address the realities of the growing numbers of Gentile believers. And it was determined uh, that they, they would place no other um, marker, benchmark in terms of, of their saving faith in the gospel itself that all of both Jews and Gentiles in hearing the gospel come to faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. And so they addressed that reality. Do, they, they were addressing the reality, are these are these Gentile people that are coming to faith, are they legitimate in terms of their belief? And how should we uh, encourage them? And it was, it was found that, that these Gentile believers were uh, coming to faith in Christ the same way that the Jews came to faith in Christ. Uh, they were being born again by the work of the Holy Spirit, by the means of the gospel and the word of God. But the fact that, that these people were steeped in cultural and familial uh, um, idolatry, that, that, that they could um, continue in those practices, uh, they sent uh, word from the council to these Gentile believers here. And listen to what they have to say. All the way back in the early developments of, of the advance of the gospel into the Gentile nations. Some probably 40 years prior to the writing of of this letter that we're reading here today. Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. One thing that they're warning them about. That you abstain from things sacrificed to idols. That's exactly what Jesus is saying that these bond servants in Thyatira that they have engaged in eating things sacrificed to idols. And then the other thing that they counseled them on, you know, which continued, they talked about uh, things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled. And then they were to abstain. Um, this letter goes out. Luke is writing, uh, uh, you know, he is writing this account of, of this council that's going out to the Gentile churches in Acts 15, there in 29. Uh, he says, uh, or they say, and uh, they are to abstain from fornication. That is sexual immorality. Fornication is uh, any type of sexual relations outside of the, um, the institution of marriage. And if you keep yourself free from such things, you will do well. They encourage the Gentile believers. Why? Why are they encouraging them in this? Because their cultures were steeped in this kind of idolatry. And much was sacrificed to these idols. And there was much fornication, sexual immorality, sexual sin 
involved in this. And Jesus, he is saying that they're in the church of of Thyatira, that there is such, uh, they're committing acts of, of um, immorality, his bondservants, and they're eating things sacrificed to idols. That this woman has convinced them that this is, is not only okay, but is permitted, and they're continuing it. Well, Jesus, he highlights that she ga- he gave Jezebel time to repent, but she does not want to repent. This woman never truly belonged to the Lord. And again, Jim Hamilton, he he states that she had been called to repentance, but she has refused to repent. Those who belong, listen, brothers and sisters, those who belong to Jesus repent of their sin. I mean, it's just, it it, it is the benchmark in terms of our faith is to turn from our sin to Christ. Jesus came to die for our sin. And we confess and repent of our sin. And she refuses to repent of sin, which this means it identifies her as an unbeliever, as an unregenerate. She is not born again. So Hamilton asks a very important question for us here today. How do we respond when we are confronted with the reality of our sin? Does it make you angry? Does it make you humble, contrite, and more grateful that Jesus died to pay the penalty for sin? Does it make you more zealous to turn away from sin in the future? Or does it make you feel like you need to be more careful not to be caught in the future? If you get angry when people call you to repentance, or if you feel yourself scheming about how to avoid being caught in the future when you plan to commit those same sins again, you are not acting like one who has been born again by the power of God's Spirit. Now, now don't get us wrong here in terms of of this reality. All have sinned and faced, uh, they, they have fallen short of the glory of God and we've been saved from our sin. And yet we face the battle of sin every day and, and the Scripture is just filled uh, with how to, to, to face that battle. We have been uh, saved from. We are no longer um, you know, s- slaves to sin, but we have been set free by the blood of Christ. And we belong to Him. And so, by refusing to repent, Jezebel declared that she did not belong to the people of God. She is not a, one of the people. And yet, she's right there in the midst of the church of Thyatira. So therefore, the church in Thyatira had a responsibility to protect the flock. They they had a responsibility to remove this woman from her midst and to remove those among uh, their church members who are continuing in the teachings of this woman and the sins, her followers. And that's, that's what we see there in verse 22. Behold, I will throw her, her children, and, and this is judgment, and this sounds... Um, you know, you know, very uh, profound and um, in terms of, of the judgment of Christ, he, he says, I will throw her on a bed of uh, sickness. Again, you know, we, we, we just see that you know, throughout, um, you know, the early developments of the church, that, that those who refuse to repent, and this, this is a prominent a uh, false prophetess who is uh, leading many astray and Jesus will not tolerate it. He, he is telling the church, stop tolerating this. I do not tolerate this. Remove this woman. Because she, she refuses to repent, I will throw her on a bed of sickness. And then those who commit adultery with her in, in, into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. In other words, those who are, are committing the sins, and he, he calls it adultery. They are, they are, are committing uh, adultery against uh, Christ. He, he is the groom. We are the bride. And they are continuing in unrepentant sin. The Lord calls us to repent of sin. He calls us to turn from our sin and to walk in fidelity with Him. And, and we need Him. We need His power. We need His grace. We need His forgiveness. We need His strength against temptation. But these people are knowingly and willfully continuing in their sin uh, and committing adultery with her. 
In other words, he's identifying uh, these people who are supposedly his bond servants. They're being misled by her, and so he's calling them to repent. And if they don't, re- they, if they don't repent, then they are not his bond servants. They are being revealed as those who are not born again. Again, as Paul, and you can look at that text in um, the opening verses, uh, 1 through 13 in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, that Paul is addressing the fact that the, the church at Corinth had a, a young man that was in their fellowship. He was a part of that church, and yet he was having relations with his father's wife, whether it, it was his biological father or a stepmother, we don't know. But what Paul is revealing there, and again, with, with the judgment of the Lord, you need to remove this man from your midst. You're continuing to tolerate this sin by enabling, allowing him to continue in the fellowship of the church. This man continues unrepentantly in his sin. And he's, he tells them, there, and most emphatically, in verse 13, but those who are outside God judgment, judges, but those who are inside the church, uh, God judges those individuals. He says uh, there at the end of verse 13, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. And again, you know, be, even before the, the foundation of, of the church, the, the final, you know, the actual formaliz- formalization of the church after the resurrection and ascension of Christ, Jesus taught us as his church in Matthew 18, to contend with sin. And I mean, we need to fight against it. We we need to fight against the temptation to sin. Uh, We need to rest in Christ. We need to pray concerning this. We need to uh, hold up the Word uh, in our lives. You know, David, he he declared in Psalm 119, um, Thy Word I have hidden in my heart. Your Word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we we need to to take all the... um, the means by which God has given us by His grace and His power to stand against sin. And then when, when we see sin and we see a brother or sister sinning, we need to come alongside of them and call them to repent of those sins. But they were tolerating sin. And you know, just as we see in 1 Corinthians, we see it here in Thyatira, they, they were tolerating sin. Sin and it had infiltrated the church, and it, it, it's much deeper than that. The Lord is going to judge Jezebel, throw her on a bed of sickness. And the Lord is going to judge her children, those who are her followers. He says he, he will kill the, her children with pestilence. And again, you know, that, that is just a physiological reality that, that he's speaking to. But I, uh, the, the worst of it all in, in terms of the judgment of Christ is eternal damnation or death, hell, and the grave is, is cast into the lake a fire that burns eternally. And is, that is to be the judgment of Satan and his followers. So Jesus says He will give to each one according to their deeds. All the, uh, and all the churches will know that I am He who searches the minds and the hearts. And then another, He knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. He knows the intentions and motives of our hearts. We may, we may outwardly express a devotion to Christ and fidelity to Christ, but He knows the depths of our hearts and our being. And He warns the, the, the church members, His bondservants at the church of Thyatira, I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Jesus is holding the entire church body accountable. And when you, when you, when you look at this, um, this text, um, you know, he is holding them a- a- accountable to her deeds. Uh, the reality is that uh, they continue to follow this woman's teaching. Jesus is announcing judgment and is stating that, that those who continue in the sin with Jezebel will be judged unless they repent. Those who belong to Jesus, they will repent those who do not belong to jesus they do not 
They won't repent, just like Jezebel. She refuses to repent. Those who refuse to repent identify themselves as belonging to Jezebel. And as we think about this, they may not only have the warning uh, with regards to the first death, that Jezebel would be thrown down on her sickbed and, and, and possibly lose her life because of her false teaching, but that those who follow her would face un, you know, the, the certainty of death as Jesus is warning here. And he, he will literally judge them and take them out physically, but there, that is a physical death, and, and, but there's a physical death that without the intervention of Christ, it leads to a second death that we see in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So even death dies. But the reality is that people who reject Christ and who refuse to repent, that they will face an eternity in the second death, in the lake of fire, not judgment. Jezebel had time to repent and she didn't do it. And he cries out to those who had followed her to repent while they still had time. And our God, our God is patient, Peter says. Not, not desiring anybody to perish, but that, that they would turn and repent and come to Him. And so then he finally brings an, an exhortation to his church. That is to those who have not engaged in the sin of Jezebel, who are not holding to the deep things of Satan that she is teaching. And it just shows that the depth you know, that, that, that Satan has gained uh, and infiltrated, gained a foothold, and has not only gained that fo- foothold, but he has infiltrated that church. Jesus speaks directly to those who have not followed Jezebel's teaching. He says there in verse 24, but I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, we don't know the number, but there are some who are not holding to this teaching. And he's, he's denouncing it. Uh, Jesus recognizes that there are those who are not holding to this teaching, and then he denounces this teaching more emphatically. He, he describes it for what it is. Um, that th- They're not holding to this teaching who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them. And again, you know, we, we just see uh, the reality of, um, you know, the... Um, the synagogue of Satan uh, with regards to um, the Asia Minor churches. Uh, we, we see the, the throne of Satan and dwelling of Satan. And now we, we find the infiltration, infiltration of Satan in the church. And Jesus says, I place no other burden on you. Well, you know, what, what is the burden that is upon them? Well, most likely, you know, th- this burden is about being in the midst of a church that has been influenced by the deep things of Satan. And in the midst of their church, they, they have a hard task of, of uh, bringing order to that church and calling out those who refuse to repent repent and remove them from their midst as Jesus has commanded them. And He commands them here in verse 25, nevertheless, what you have, that is, you have uh, your faith, you have uh, your faith in Me, you have the Gospel, you have My Word. Hold fast until I come, He says. So we must hold fast the faith that has been passed down from previous generations, brothers and sisters. And then he encourages them. He, he, he gives them promises that he who overcomes, and, and again, we've already noted that those who are overcome belong to Christ. Because we are more than overcomers in Christ Jesus. So though he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds, in other words, who accomplish my works, which we're called to do, and we're obedient to, to these good works to the end, that we hold fast and, and overcome and, and keep His work of service, His Word, His ministry until the end, His Gospel and proclaiming His Gospel to the end. 
He promises to give them both a kingdom and a king. And listen how he describes this. To him I will give authority over the nations. That takes us back to Psalm 2 as we read from there earlier that, that God was giving His Son, His beloved Son that He had begotten, He was giving to them, to Him that is, authority over all the nations. He was giving them. He was giving to Him all the nations. And so He's saying to those who overcome, who belong to Him, these are people who have true faith in Him, uh, I will give authority over the nations. In other words, that they will reign with Him. He will give them a kingdom and authority with Him. We will reign with Him. And He will rule, it says there, uh, He will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are, are, are broken uh, to pieces. As, and again, we see that in, in Psalm chapter 2 as we read earlier. And what does it mean that He will rule them? Well, you know, we see the rod of iron. The rod of iron is... is and the, you know, certainly judgment and justice and those kinds of things. And yet the, the word for rule there is poimene. And it means to shepherd. That he is not only going to judge righteously, but he is going to shepherd. He is the good shepherd that is going to rule. He's, he's going to bring his sheep to rule with Him. And we're looking at this in terms of the reign. They will reign with Christ at, at, at the time of the millennial kingdom here on earth. And then He goes on to the, say that He will share with them the authority He received from His Father. Again, they will reign with Him by His authority. And He will give them the morning star, the King. And that's what the morning star is here. Revelation 22 tells us who the morning star is. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. What, what a beautiful promise that not only do, do we reign with Christ in His kingdom, but He says, I will give to him, I will give to the overcomer. I will give to those who are his people, myself, the king. He is giving himself to us. And that there's so much meaning in terms of all that, but, but when we think of it, you know, basically, uh, that, that we will dwell with Christ in his kingdom, that we will belong with him, that we will fellowship with him, we will reign with him. He is our King. We will worship Him. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And again, at the end of each letter, he takes the application of, of the specific letter he's writing to a particular church. And he says, churches, you need to heed. You need to read, to hear, to, to, to read and, and heed these words. Hear these words. He who has an ear, who has the ear, who has, who has an ear, is the one who belongs to Christ. By the Holy Spirit, by the means of the Holy Spirit, well, we are born again and belong to Christ. He has our ear. We can hear our Good Shepherd leading us and He leads us according to His Word. Jesus is writing this letter to His church in Thyatira. And He is commending His church there for their deeds. Their love, faith, service, perseverance. These are the kinds of things that must characterize every church in every generation in every era. Must I, this must identify and characterize who we are, brothers and sisters, as, the, as His church. And yet He condemns His church in Thyatira for tolerating the sin and false teaching of this prophet at Prophetess Jezebel. They, they were continuing in the church. And yet, as members of that church, they were following not the Word of God, but the false teaching, the false prophecies of this woman. And they were engaging 
in her adultery and her idolatry. And the Lord had given this woman an opportunity to repent and she refused. That is the grace of God. And He has given these church members the opportunity to repent. And we don't have the follow-up to how some of these people responded. But He gives us, brothers and sisters, the opportunity to repent. Repent from what? Repent from engaging in false prophets and false teachings and, and those things that, that the Word defines as ungodly and immoral. And that we are not to be engaging in such behaviors and in such sin. And it, it is just prevalent. It is prevalent throughout. You, you see it in terms of social media and postings and people are uh, they are encouraging people to look at this book or watch this video or what have you. I mean, uh, the opportunities to be engaging in these types of things in our world is exponentially greater than any other time in world history. So, brothers and sisters, we must be diligent to hold fast to the Word of God. And we must stand against these false teachings, gospels, prophets. We must stand against the sin that is propagated by such things, such movements. We need to grow in the Word and in our likeness. We need to grow in the maturity of Christ so that we are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the deceptions of godless, godless men. Brothers and sisters, He's encouraging us here today. He exhorts those who are faithful in His church, not only in Thyatira, but in our church today, to hold fast His works, His deeds, until He comes. And as Jim Hamilton writes and provides a fitting invitation this morning, Jesus, He is the Davidic King. He is the promised King of Israel, the promised Messiah. He is the bright morning star. He says He gives Himself to us. Jesus is the Davidic King who is searching and pure. He is holy. And He knows our deeds, whether they are godly or godless. Nothing is hidden from His eyes like flames of fire. He is opposed to false prophetesses who do not belong to His people, who like Jezebel of old, seduce His people and lead them into idolatry and immorality. And as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, these kinds of things should not even be counted or named among His church. Jesus calls His own to repent of sin. And He brings affliction to lead people to repentance. There might be some in our day that, that look at the pandemic and describe it in, in terms of pestilence. And, and, and very much so, it could be described as that from our Lord. Irregardless of how we understand uh, the realities of, of, of having this type of virus and this pandemic in our world, uh, what we have seen in terms of it is the reality of, of, of the need that we have that you know, we, we might do all that we can to, to live healthy lives. And we might do all the, the, the things that are necessary to maintain that health. But the reality is that each one of us are going to face the reality of death. There's a time to be born and a time to die. What the Lord calls us to is, is not, not simply to overcome disease and illness and those kinds of things. And we need to pray about that. We need to pray for those that are engaged in those battles. He calls us to pray for the sick. But even every person that Jesus healed during His earthly ministry, He healed and brought wholeness to their body. Each one of them faced the imminent reality of death. Even Lazarus, whom He raised up from the dead, would die again. 
So he is calling us to repent. To repent of sin. Because the wage of sin is death. And yet, as Hamilton notes, Jezebel refused to repent. And others who claim to be Christians, but who do not repent, show themselves to be Jezebel's followers. Her children. And the seed of the serpent, because she was teaching the deep things of Satan. The good news is that Jesus forgives His own who repent, and He spares them from the judgment that is to come. The church is called to purity, to called to holiness. He has set us apart. They should no longer tolerate the sin and false teaching of not only Jezebel, but any other false teacher or false prophet or false gospel provocateur. Those who overcome will reign with Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, we just thank You for the gift of Your Word. And we pray for our fellow churches throughout uh, this uh, community and throughout this nation and throughout this world that are battling the realities of, of occupied territory, of enemy territory, of, of the influence of Satan in so many different ways and false prophets and gospels and teachings that are out there that not only are in our communities and in idolatry and, and other forms of worship and false gods and those kinds of things. But Lord, it's just, uh, just all over the internet in so many different ways and how people can, in the privacy of their own home, be captivated by such things and misled and, and led, a, led astray and, and leading a secret lives of sin. But that's only secret to us, God. Not secret to You. With Your piercing, flaming eyes that sees all things and knows all things. And so, Lord, may we turn to You. May we, as, as Your people, continue to turn to You in repentance from our sin that we sin on a daily basis. And may we see people come to faith in Christ and would hear this word today and recognize that You have opened their eyes to see the sinfulness of their ways and the false worship that they have been giving to other things other than the one true God. Lord, we love You and we give You praise. Lead us, Father. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And Amen.